Thank you to Kai Audio for sponsoring this video. Today I'm gonna walk through the different kinds of processing you can use on your mix bus. I'll give you an example of the plugins that I use in each category, ways that I use them, and some ways where I feel like you can go a bit too far with them. So let's jump into it. Also a disclaimer, I'm gonna be using a limiter at the end of the chain, just so everything is out of volume where you can hear it, but I'll try to gain match everything as much as possible. And this is the instrumental that we'll be using as our example. So the first thing we're gonna look at is EQ, specifically a digital EQ. I only clarified digital because we're gonna be going into some more analogy stuff later on, but yeah, everybody knows uh, Pro Q3 is a really solid option for this. The way that I tend to use EQ like this on a mix bus is a high pass filter to sort of clean up the low end. A little bit of a mid-range cut. Maybe a one half K boost. And maybe a like four K cut. Also, depending on the beat, sometimes I'll do a little bit of a boost here. Now you can see I'm being very gentle with it. So if you have Pro Q open by default, it will actually look like this, which you can see is not a lot, which in my opinion is the best way to use more digital EQ like this. Unless you have some really nasty problem that you're trying to remove, going as light as you can to just sort of generally enhance the things that you like about it and remove the things that you want to control. That tends to be the best way of doing it. A way that I feel like is not helpful is doing big scoops, big boosts, that are more than a DB, which in the regular version of the plugin look like this. So before, after. And the reason you don't really wanna do aggressive moves like those is because really, if you have to do aggressive moves like that where you're having to boost that much high end or that much low end, the solution is most likely going back to the individual elements of your mix and just fixing them there. Like if you have to do a super deep cut of 4K because there's a lot of harshness in your track, you should probably just solo the 4K band and be like, okay, what elements are in there? It's, I am hearing a lot of like the snare that I have. So maybe tame some of the snare and hi-hat frequency so that you're not just cutting that frequency out of everything. The next thing is more of an analog style EQ. Um, I'm using a Poltec right now, but there's tons of different kinds. And I'm normally using these as a flavor enhancer. Like we're not being as clinical as much as we're being sort of painterly or musical. So with this kind of EQ, you can select ranges to boost or cut or boost and cut at the same time. That's something special about this EQ. So if I were to listen to this track and be like, it needs a little bit more air. What I might do is go to like this 16K range and start boosting this. You can hear that sizzle now. So maybe back it off a little bit and then attenuate that same frequency. So both this boost and attenuation are at 16K. And so this is gonna sort of ease into 16K a little bit easier. And then let's do the same thing with the low end. Uh, let's get some beef going underneath this. I like the 20. You can just hear it. it just adds a little bit of clarity, adds a little bit of warmth in the low end. I think a way to overuse it is kind of what I showed you before, where you're really just like boosting these like into the higher ranges or cutting a lot because you're trying to make up for like a lack of something in the mix. But yeah, this can be a great tool to use in combination with a digital EQ because you can use a digital EQ to sort of attenuate all the things that you don't really like that much, get the mix really controlled. And then after it, use something like an analog style EQ where it's adding a little bit more flavor. It's probably based off of some analog piece of hardware. So they probably have some kind of harmonic saturation thing going on in the background and it's adding character to the track and the EQ boosts that you're doing. They're not like dialed in like, okay, let me find the exact range of this frequency. You're just sort of boosting or cutting general ranges. Next we have compression. This is what I would call like a digital compressor. Cause similar to like EQs, I feel like there's two categories. There's compressors that are like really clean, like this one, the Katalnikov from TDR 
VR, which is a really powerful, like free mastering plugin, by the way. But it's made to just be like very dialed in and very tight. We can also use this Delta feature to really hear what the compressor is doing. So here's the first way that I would use it is sort of like a general compression. Uh, I turned off my limiter for a sec just because I feel like it's easier to hear what it's doing when it's not going through the limiter. So here we have it just sort of a general compression. We have sort of a 30 millisecond ish attack. So it kind of fades in a little bit. And then I would say like medium to medium slow release. So if we listen to the Delta, which is kind of like the solo frequency button on like a compressor, but it's just showing you like what the dynamics are doing. You can hear it like really triggering off of like the kick and the snare. So if I turn it off right now, the way that it will like interact with like the drums and the rest of the track, because right now I have my drums like significantly louder than the rest of the track. Another way we could use it is we use this high pass filter. We bring it up to about 120 ish so that we can get more of a pumping effect happening on the snare. So you can see like a compressor like this is really good at doing more of like the clinical attack time stuff, like dialing in like, okay, exactly how do we want the mix to sort of pump around the track? Or do we want it to have sort of like longer release, longer tails, and then really dial that in. Where I think you can go a little bit too aggressive with this guy is when you start going above like one dB of gain reduction. It's just everything feels like it's pumping around each other and it's like the dynamics feel like they're just like kind of going like this all the time where it's like we want to almost like design the compressor so that it's like lifting up parts of the song that need to be lifted up so that we can get a bit more of an even glue to everything. The next thing we're going to look at is analog compression, which I'm going to show you using this uh, Enfuse from Kive, which by the way are the sponsors of this video. They just launched this cool plugin called the Enfuse, which is a mixture of a Neve MTB and an SSL Fusion, but it's cool because you can select each individual module from one of those two pieces of rack gear, which are kind of notoriously famous, like mix bus processors. So yeah, I would highly recommend checking it out. So you can use an analog style compressor in a very similar way as the compressor that we were using before, where you're using it to sort of like dial in like the glue of a mix. And the advantage of using an analog style compressor like this or Slate Virtual Bus Compressor is another really good one, is you get sort of an analog characteristic imparted into the mix beyond just like the actual like attack times and things that you're dialing in with the compressor. But I'm gonna use this as an example to do parallel compression. So I'm on the Neve MTB compressor here. And what I've done is left the attack and release about where I want it to be. And I've just brought down the threshold all the way, which is a really over compressed sound. It's just everything is over compressed right now. So now that we've got this like really insanely compressed version of our track pumping through it, we can then take the blend knob and sort of bring it down and bring in a little bit of that like over compressed sound, which is gonna fill out a lot of like the mid range. While I'm doing this, I will also show you guys how I like you. And on this plugin, you have an analog style EQ, which is fun for just boosting or cutting in certain ranges. But we're going to turn those off because what I want to look now at is saturation. So saturation is a way to bring out harmonics in a mix, which can be done to do multiple things. You can use it to bring out the warmth in something. You can use it to bring sort of like a brighter, more silky high end. So for this track, I'm actually going to use a little bit of the F saturation. So I'm just going to turn up the drive a little little bit. Well, actually here, let me turn up the drive a lot so I can show you what it's doing. Like you can hear it's almost like clipping in an analog way, which is kind of cool. So if we bring it back a bit and then bring up the density a little bit. If we turn it off, Back on. 
a lot of mix bus processing, you don't really want it to be like an insane, like, oh, this thing is super dark. Then I flip a switch. Oh, now it's super bright. Like by the time you get to this point of the chain, every little thing you do should be like 1% here, 5% here, like overall changes. Another plugin you can use for this is a uh, Saturn II by FabFilter. We also have stereo enhancement, which you can use to make things a little bit wider. So if I boost the width here, you'll hear it right away. Like everything feels like it's on the sides of the speakers now. So you don't want to go too heavy handed with it. Again, like some people will use this as a way to make up for the fact that there's not enough sounds in their mix that are stereo or that are interesting in the stereo space, things panning left and right and things like that. So this is meant to just be like a little bit of width that just sort of makes the mix as a whole reach out around the headphones a little bit more. And then you have a high pass filter here. So instead of just making the whole mix reach around, which normally you don't need. You can just have everything above like 500 reach out around the headphones and leave the low end where it needs to be. So that's with it on. With it off. You can hear everything get a little bit more center when I turn it off. So back with it on again. Off. So that can be a fun way to make things a little bit wider. One thing to be careful with with stereo enhancement is you do have the potential of introducing phase issues if you are excessive with it. So again, it's best to use this as just like a little bit of spice on the end of it after you've already gone through your mix and made everything wide and interesting in stereo. Next, we have multiband compression. So this is compression that is band specific. So we have a specific band here that is its own compressor and it's just listening to everything below 100 160 hertz. We have one above that that's listening to everything 160 to 800. For multiband compression, I like using the Dyn 1 by Leapwing Audio. Another great one is Waves Lin MB. That was a really big favorite of mine for a long time. And there's actually quite a few ways you can use multiband compression. So one way is to just turn off everything except for the low end and just slowly bring it down until we start taming the low end a bit. You can see it triggering here on the kick. And this can be a way to clean up a track where there's like really excessive low end or maybe the low end's a little bit flubbier than you would like it to be. Another way you could use it is by soloing the mid range bands and doing something very similar. You can control a little bit more of the mid range. I feel like that style of multiband compression tends to work best on like rock mixes, not so much trap stuff like this, just because there is a lot more mid range elements happening like vocals, distorted guitars. So I would recommend doing one of those two approaches, not necessarily both, a way that people can go overboard with multiband compression is where they just sort of bring everything down. And it's like frequency wise, yeah, it's evened out, but it's like almost like flatlined in a weird way. But actually my favorite way of using using multiband compression is specifically in Leapwing's parallel mode. So it's acting as like a parallel compressor right now. So these meters are showing you how much it's compressing all the bands, but it's not actually letting anything through right now because all of these faders are down here at zero, which is like the blend knob of it. So if I raise these guys up. It's just a lot more body and present. If I turn it off. It like fills it out so much more. That's honestly probably if I had to pick like my favorite way of using multiband compression, it would be that because it's the least like intrusive in my mind. And it's the best way to like maximize loudness if you're trying to get things slapping into a limiter without necessarily like compressing everything downward. It's more like an upward compression, which speaking of which we have upwards compression, which you can get using the uh, low level slider on Waves MV2. And basically it's exactly what it sounds like instead of compressing things from the top down, crushing the louder peaks so that you can turn everything up a little bit. It will just look in between those peaks and sort of raise everything up a little bit. So if I like really dime it, you'll hear everything except the drums just get a lot louder. A 
again, be careful with using this too much because you can really make a weirdly compressed sound out of it. Uh, I like bringing it around this range here just to bring stuff up a little bit in the mix. Here's with it on. With I turn it off. You can hear those like weird like things in the background of the mix. They're like a lot quieter when I have it turned off. So with it on. Turning it off. So that's how you can use upwards compression. Now we're getting to the part of the video where we're going into tools that are more like modern. So this is Soothe 2 by Oak Sound. It is a resonant frequency tamer. When we hit play, those are all resonant frequencies in the mix that are really poking out and it's pulling them back down. So if I hit the Delta here, you'll hear it. Like all of the hyper resonant stuff is just kind of being pulled out right now. And as you can tell, it's really easy to go overboard with something like this because it's almost like the same thing as when you have like a Rhodes keyboard and you start like frequency notching every annoying frequency. Like on some level, the sound of the instrument is like resonant frequencies. So if you notch out everything annoying about a Rhodes keyboard, you end up notching out the entire instrument. And something very similar happens with Soothe. If we just like dime everything that's annoying, the whole mix kind of just disappears. Versus when I turn it off. So pulling it back a little bit. Being sure it's not going too crazy. And it can be a general sort of taming tool that like helps you really control like resonant frequencies in specific areas. Normally I'm using some of the presets to narrow in on a specific range. So maybe the mid range I have is a little bit too resonant. So I'll just do the mid range. But yeah, I'm also using this on like hi hats or cymbals specifically to clean up some of this weird ringing like 4K to 8K range where it's like you can't really EQ it out. It's just kind of like built into the cymbal, but you can almost make it sound Sound like it's a darker symbol. Now we are going to transient designers. Uh, this is Impact by Ozone. So this is a little bit different from the Dyne 1 because the Dyne 1 is a multiband compressor. This is a multiband transient designer. If I'm going to be completely honest, this is probably the one that I have like the least amount of experience with just because like in the genres that I do, I tend to not require this level of like transient detail designing. But yeah, if we hit play. You can see there's a bunch of different lines that are looking at different frequency spectrums and they are adjusting the transient. So like how hard they hit in the mix. So if I bypass it off and on, then on. So you can see like the kicks are really getting emphasized whenever the blue line is up or whenever the pink is going up, that's really when the snares are hitting. In the rare instances when I've used something like this and I'm trying to get things a little bit punchier, I'm really being sure to use it on the amount slider here and only like introduce a little bit. Like it's a little bit weird on the ears if you're just doing all of the transient designing on the mix bus, but you could very easily turn off all these guys and say adjust the decay on just the low end. tighten up the low end that way. Next, we have a limiter, which I don't think too many people who are looking at Mixbus videos are confused about what a limiter is, but just in case you are, it is basically a compressor that has an infinite ratio and a very hard ceiling that you can set, where whenever you set the output level or the ceiling, no matter what happens, nothing will go above that ceiling. It will just sort of squash everything into that ceiling, which if you go super aggressive with it, things will just like sound weird. Like it'll sound really squashed, but if you use it correctly, you can get a lot of loudness out of it. So I recommend people use a limiter on their mix bus just because A, it's really helpful to know that you're not going to clip, like you're not gonna bounce out a file and find out that it's clipping after the fact, but also like, let's say this track is like really quiet. and I try sending that to somebody for them to listen to it, it's like, uh, you can't really hear what's going on. So if I boost it, and if I turn it off, 
I mean, I can basically hear the snare and nothing else. Now I can hear everything. So limiter is probably the one thing that you should spend the most time learning when it comes to mixed bus processing. And then we will leave the limiter on for our next plugin, which is a clipper, which does something very similar to a limiter. The second something goes above the threshold, it will sort of keep it from going any louder than that. The difference is a clipper is going to be using a clipping circuit, unlike a limiter. A limiter is using a gain reduction circuit, which is like what a compressor uses. So if you have something really aggressive going in to a limiter, what you're gonna hear is there's like a pump every time something really loud hits the limiter because the rest of the mix is just gonna pump underneath it. What you're gonna hear with a clipper is instead of having this squashed feel, you're going to hear it actually not audibly change that much. Like it's gonna have a little bit of a punch that peeks out on top of it. So here, let me show you. Just have a regular clipper going on and then you can see this red here, that's when we're clipping. So like here, if we look at our limiter here, when we have our clipper going on, we're getting about this much loudness. If I take the clipper and turn it off, you can see now we're actually triggering the limiter. Again, if I turn the clipper on, So here it's showing there's like a 5 dB difference between when we have the clipper on and the clipper off. It's like actually making it quieter, but it sounds exactly the same. And that's probably my favorite way of using the clipper is not necessarily to distort everything about a mix, but to just clip the tips of the mountains off of the really loud parts of the mix so that then you can boost it into a limiter. Because as long as you don't go too aggressive with the clipper, you'll get a really clean sort of clipped sound where when you gain Match it, it almost sounds like nothing is happening, but it's actually like a few dB quieter, which will then allow you to boost it into the limiter without much pumping. I'm doing that on like almost all of the mastering jobs that I'm doing. But yeah, that's all the mixed bus processors that I'm using right now. If you have one that you're using that I didn't mention, put it down below. Again, thank you to Kai for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you guys next week.